thank you for that warm welcome. That's a, um, yeah, I, it's, uh, yeah, I'm a bit taken aback. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I guess I come from a bit of a changeling area compared to what probably people are going to be talking about today because my, my area is in immersive virtual reality systems and related technology. So, you know, it's a great pleasure and an honor, Alberto, to invite me here to talk about this. I've been sort of grinding away on this for about 10 years and um, some nice results are coming from the research I'm doing, so I'm going to share them with you. But I need to sort of introduce you to some of the concepts that I'm trying to investigate and how they apply to BPM. So I will ask if, you, if I could indulge, you could indulge me a little bit as I just talk you through. First of all, just a quick introduction. Who am I? My name is Ross Brown. I'm a course coordinator of a games development degree at QUT in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. I've spent about 28 years teaching, around 17 years researching the use of virtual reality and games in non-entertainment uh, contexts, typically called serious games, uh, but now turning into sort of the term gamification. So in some ways, I'm trying to gamify BPM in areas that I can see. Interestingly enough, who am I? Well, that's probably me in a virtual reality system asking myself that same question every day. So, but this is uh, just an image from some work I do with environmental management. Virtual reality has lots of applications across many domains. But today I wish to talk about the business process management for you guys. So what is the thing that I guess I have uh, discovered for myself that is probably, it gave me this sort of drive to continue to work in this area is that the realization that new research in psychology and the neurosciences indicate that we are a heavily embodied cognitive being. And maybe that's sort of straightforward. You think of that as, oh, well, sort of makes sense. I'm in a body. But it is interesting the relationship between your body and how you think. Um, and some of you are going, why, why would I talk about this at a BPM conference? I'll, I'll get to that, but we have to go through a bit of a path here. So we have an intimate relationship with ourselves and the rest of the world. Our brain responds to the world around us. The research in 1979, Gibson came up with the idea of ecological psychology and the fact that we're not little finite state automata sort of wiring around inside our heads, but we respond to the affordances or the usefulness of the world around us. And this means that the way uh, we think about the world and the way we think is very heavily based upon the fact we're dealing with this physical reality around us. And it manifests itself in some very interesting examples. And I have three that I go through just to show you how the high level cognitive processes that we have are based upon our relationship with our body and its relationship to the world around us. Wrestling. Some people are asking, what the heck is he talking about wrestling? Wrestlers are an interesting animal, and I say animal appropriately, because they're very good at spatial reasoning. So if you put psychological tests with wrestlers, they're very good at reasoning about mass and center of mass and velocity and, and moving things around because their life is about moving things with their bodies. Take their hands and tie their hands behind their back and they lose this ability to engage in that spatial reasoning. And funnily enough, so do, so do normal humans who don't engage in wrestling. So our ability to reason about space is highly, targ is highly bound in the way we use our bodies. We use our hands. And you can see me doing this with gestures. I'm reasoning with my body to aid me to speak. Second little insight about our body and reasoning and a cognition and the world around us. If you go to a dentist and you want to remember the event, I don't know why, you could take a selfie. Or experiments show that if you want to remember more about the dental appointment, simply lean back in your chair and you place your body in the same position that you had in the appointment and you'll remember more about those events because you situate yourself in the same position as those memories were laid down in your mind with, via your body. Last but not least, there's an interesting syndrome called Gerstmann syndrome. Gerstmann syndrome is caused um, when a lesion forms in the brain for various reasons, stroke, cancer, something like that. 
Um, and what happens is that you develop some uh, sort of aphasias or absences of cognition uh, in your thinking. And what happens is you lose your ability to count and understand numbers. But the interesting thing as well is you lose how to, uh, understanding of your hands because we learn to count typically by going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the idea is that our whole numeric system potentially the way we understand numbers is based upon aspects of our body. So the point being for those three humorous examples, well, the last one's not so humorous, is the idea that higher order sort of cognition or higher order thinking emerges a lot from our bodies. It emerges a lot from our interactions with the world and we use our bodies to understand the world and it affects how we think. In particular, things such as memory, are heavily affected by it, our language are heavily affected by it. How does this relate to BPM? Well, the thing that I've been investigating is the idea that business processes, for the moment, until the coming AI apocalypse that uh, has been described to us beforehand, involve humans. Humans are heavily contextualized when they are actually enacting a process. The way they are doing a process, if it's about humans, doing the task, not computers, but if the humans are involved, they will be using that same elements of cognition to get their jobs done in an environment. And so this means that, of course, as business process analysts and business process managers and every other, who, every people who are stakeholders in these environments, uh, sorry, these uh, models, you are wanting to abstract the information out so you can analyze what's going on. But that process of abstraction, you lose context. And I would argue in some of the experiments and case studies that I cover here that some information is lost or some ability to engage with people is lost as you try to do these abstractions. So this is where my background in computer graphics and virtual reality comes in. So one of the... So We've had a talk about the explosion of AI, and that's probably the, the major focus for today. Uh, but I guess well, there's a concomitant explosion that's occurring with immersive virtual reality systems. We now have virtual reality systems for, you know, they're about $1,400 in Australia. I have one. My lounge room is now configured as a virtual reality setup. And you're able to immerse yourselves in these environments, and these environments then take over your senses and allow you to interact with a computational system by your body. And this starts to mimic the very thing that you experience as a human being in reality. So my senses are fully immersed in this reality. Okay, I'm not, I can't get any other information other than what I have here. If I put one of these headsets on that we see, then my eyes are immersed visually in the virtual reality and my head movements are tracked and that means that I feel as though I'm inside that environment my, uh, and all the cognition that occurs through this embodiment starts to affect my thinking inside these synthetic immersive spaces. So those two terms, immersive meaning the senses are immersed in the environment and the embodiment meaning you can use your body to interact with the system. So of course we're used to using just desktop screens that's our sort of standard way of interacting with a computational system. But now we have these systems available that have come about that enable us to very cheaply and very easily build virtual reality systems to engage with either entertainment or other very serious applications. So what I want to talk to briefly today uh, in my allotted time is just about how some of these cognitive effects that come from virtual reality and lesser immersive 3D systems can affect certain aspects of business process management, especially in its life cycle. So, so these are two uh, experimental areas that uh, I've been working on in co uh, collaboration with a number of colleagues in the area of business process management. And the first case study I want to talk about today is about process elicitation. So this is sort of knowledge capture. This is about having a business where people um, are performing their tasks. And in this space, 
you want to be able to extract that information from them in order to build your process models. Usually it's death by post-it note, okay? That's usually what happens. You put people in a room and you capture that knowledge from them about their processes to get from a non-process model environment to the next level of actually having modeled some of those processes. So this project came about from an interaction with a German company called Metasonic, Gebeha, um, and they have their own uh, approach to business process management called subject-oriented business process management. And so they approached me to say, well, what can we do with virtual reality or virtual worlds in this space in order to help us capture information from people? Um, and in addition to that, we also interact with a professor from the University of Vienna, Stephanie Rindelamar, um, around looking at this same topic. How can we process, how can we merge information from different traces from people's interviews to form process models? Um, the problem is, of course, that typically there's interview processes, there's also role play processes that are used to extract this information. This is popular across many domains, not just business process management. There's also sort of physical objects that have to be uh, often in just sort of product creation, software user requirements for other domains, but as well as in business process management, this, you know, this process has to be undertaken to extract what actually does a company do. And so there are problems with accuracy and scalability of these methods that make the approach problematic at times. I mean, the best approach is probably to trail somebody around as they work. But unfortunately, that, that can be, may not be possible. It could be their work's very important, their time is expensive. It could be that it's dangerous to watch them do their work. It could be other factors just remove the ability to be able to observe them clearly performing their work. So what we did was we took this process elicitation approach, this data gathering, Paul talked about the need for good data gathering in order to feed into these large AI systems, whether it be process systems or other aspects. And so we took the subject-based business process management approach and we mapped it to a virtual world. And what we see here is the very simple, they use a natural language approach from a subjective perspective, and then they use an approach to merge those subjective traces to form the process model. It's their approach. I'm not a shill for Metasonic, it's just that they, their work was closely aligned with what I get up to. And so what they have there is if you're moving around in some sort of space, so in, in reality you would do a task such as you're at a passenger terminal and you use a computer to print check-in information. We can simulate that and we can also use that and map that to this subject-based business process management component, the subject, the predicate, the verb that you're actually doing and the object that you're doing it with. And we can map that effectively to create process models using virtual worlds and virtual reality. And so that was the first step. We innovated on that. We did the project with Metasonic and that's great. Then a PhD student came on and said, okay, let's, let's keep developing this and exploring further. What are the cognitive effects of using virtual reality to extract this information? So we built an airport, as you do. Uh, so my PhD student, he's an ex game student of mine from the undergraduate degree that I'm taking through supervision. And we built an airport, and uh, we just use it as a lab for exploring how can we get this process information effectively in these environments, and more importantly, explore what are the utilities, what are the usefulness of such environments towards these process modeling tasks. So as you can see, as you wander around inside the environment, you are able to interact with entities, whether it be people at the check-in counter, and you specify the tasks that you think you have to do for a check-in, and then you move around in the space, which is important to us as human-computer interaction researchers, until you finally come to the boarding point where you go on the plane and take off. As you can see on the right, there's a pile of activities that are specified, we also have mechanisms for including choices, all the sort of aspects of process models that are required, and out comes an automatically generated process model. That's well and fine. Um, but we need to see, is there utility in this? Is it useful? What does it do? And driven by those embodied and immersive cognitive aspects that I mentioned, 
we wanted to see just what effect this has on a person when you're trying the specified process model. By the way, the reason we use an airport is because it's a nice sort of example of a process that people know. So checking in is something that I have done a lot of in the last few days to get myself over here. Um, the, uh, you know, our, our cohort, our 20-year-old university students that I, wink, wink, tend to do my experiments with, also have done a lot of travel. We tested them and they said, yeah, we've done a lot of travel. And it's also been used in all of other process modeling research literature because of these aspects. It's a nice model to get people to just extract information about from. So we set up an experiment. Uh, we, took a we built a 2D tool based upon the subject oriented process modeling approach. And that's what you see being used up in the top left hand corner here. And we took 64 randomly assigned 20 year old university students, roughly equally male, female, and put them through this process of extracting knowledge from them. They're not process modelers, they're naive people who know about the process, but we need to get this knowledge out of them to build a process model of how they do things. The experiment was done by priming them with a video of what the sort of gold standard process was. We gave them a break, go away, do something, come back, then tell me what were the steps in that process model. And that meant that we're trying to compare these two modalities to see what works better. And interestingly enough, we then took that and moved it from, let's just do it on a desktop, we then immersed them further into a virtual reality headset, just to see, all right, if we embody them and immerse them in these environments, do we get better data? And the answers from our results are yes. Interestingly enough, if you get people to elicit knowledge in this manner, in this manner, with a, a process modeling manner, uh, first of all, the desktop virtual world that we had, taking them through that check-in process, people specify more tasks than they do from the 2D uh, non-immersive environment. They also create fewer erroneous task sequences. So, the people who are in the virtual world got it right because they were primed by the environment. Interestingly enough, this is the one that shocked us, the people in the desktop virtual world compared to this sort of unstructured 2D environment use much more consistent set of words. Their language changed. They were so heavily primed by the environment, they used a smaller set of words because the stimulus was the same compared to the people using a 2D tool they thought up any set of words and they had a very broad vocabulary to describe their process model. The key nicety about process models, you want to have a nice tight sort of specification for them. Then finally, when we put them in the virtual reality immersive environment, they did better again. So even just being inside one of the headsets, wandering around using their eyes, and a, a, we just gave them an Xbox controller to move around in the environment to do the tasks, they did better again. We've published this in a number of papers that I have as references at the end of these slides, so I'll make sure these slides are available for those who are interested in the academic side. But what this seemed to show from this first excursion, the first case study, is that it does seem to get more data out of people and better data out of people for this initial laboratory test. Um, but I presented this at a conference in Sweden. And one man stood up and said, that's all well and good, but BPM people aren't interested in spatial processes. So after I looked at him and said, thanks for that, um, I moved on and thought, right, I'm going to take up this challenge and see, all right, what can we do to prove this guy wrong? So we did a second case study. What's that got to do with Sherlock Holmes? It's the process palace case study that we put together. It's a project that I'm working on with uh, Freya University in Amsterdam, uh, with Professor Heio Reyes, and with a German university, University of Rostock in northern Germany. Who watches Sherlock Holmes? The one with Benedict Cumberbatch. Who's a big fan of it? Okay. So when you watch the show, he does the memory palace thing, doesn't he? He sits there and he goes, right, I've got to trawl through all this data and he closes his eyes, he rolls his eyes in the back of his head, he moves his hands, 
and you, he's moving around in some sort of virtual environment in his head and he comes up with the facts, the answers. He associates things and he's able to remember things better that way. That is a real thing. So German researchers have concluded uh, this Greek, it's an ancient Greek idea of a memory palace actually does support you remembering more things. It's a real thing. What he's doing on Sherlock Holmes, if you practice that trick, you can double your memory capacity according to this paper. So I looked at that, looked at Sherlock Holmes, and I thought, right, I want to ask the question, if I've just got a process model, say a software bug fixing ticket allocation system, which has nothing to do with space at all, and I put it in a virtual world office, what sort of effects does it have on the cognition of the people regarding the memory of that process? Because that's why we call it the process palace. Let's just drop processes in a palace and see what happens regarding people remembering those processes better. So, as I like to do when this thing clicks over, I bought an office, because you just do that. Oh no, it's gone far. Go, go back, 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 pop that, back, back. Ooh, dunker. Um, so we're in um, an office, and it's not running because it started from, let me get this going, yeah. Funny, runs automatically forwards, but not backwards. So we built an office, an office, just an office. Just put it in a 3D space. And what we did was we came up with a method for placing uh, BPMN process model activity structures in there. It's not rocket science. So I've taken a 2D model and I've popped it inside the process palace at locations. The locations correspond to swim lanes and rolls. So in this case, there's three rolls. It's a bug fixing ticket allocation system. There's a a person is requesting a fix, there's support, and then we come across the nerdy developer sitting in his little um, cube later on. So the visualization approach, we, we played with this, we wrote a paper, we need to modify it in order to make it animated. So the activities start off as being read, when they're enacted by pressing the space bar, you see what the inputs, the systems that are being used, and the outputs from that activity. And then you hit the space bar again, and you might get a choice dialog come up to say you've made a choice to go here, or you just go to the next activity. So you saw a dialog pop up there at the support. So um, it's just a 2D diagram in an office space. Uh, and by the way, this movie is running quicker than normal. When we did the experiments, we let people just look at it, and when they felt happy, move to the next activity. So it's not a race through it. You're not running through your process. But this represents a trace through a diagram. It's just a subjective view of a certain path through a process model. And we wanted to use this in our experiment. So we did another experiment. We did a comparison with a 2D version of this trace through the, the 2D model and compared it with the 3D version. We had 40 people this time, but that was statistically powerful enough for us to do some science. The these were students in process modeling from Freya University and Rostock University. And uh, they class them as naive modelers, people who are just learning to process model and therefore need to be open to this sort of training capabilities. So I put them in as sort of appropriate proxies for process trainees. So we did the experiment and what happened? Funnily enough, even if you put a 2D diagram inside, this clicker is dying and I'm losing my drama. All right, do it old school. So, um, so our hypotheses were confirmed that just placing process model elements inside a virtual world, just on a desktop, people recall more information, they're more accurate about the model, and they're actually faster in answering the questionnaire. We timed them. So it seems that the person's cognition was fired up. They were very confident. It's often a proxy for confidence. If a person answers quickly and you check the confounds, they're probably just, yeah, I know this, and they fell it out and they remembered much more about the process model. But remember, in that office, there's no connection 
to the process model itself. It's just an office, and it's enough to get the memory palace effect occurring inside of people's heads. Because even with virtual worlds, when, when you're walking through the space, like I am now, my hippocampus is remembering where I'm walking automatically. We won't talk about how I lose my car in car parks often at supermarkets, but we won't talk about that. But typically, humans are very good at remembering locations. And so it seems that this enables us to enhance people's ability to remember things about process models. So, from those two experiments, two case studies, we see some evidence emerging that this immersive technology can assist in two tasks. That is, A, getting knowledge out of people, B, putting that knowledge back into them because it enhances cognition in certain ways, either by priming them to remember what they do or putting it in a location makes them remember more easily. So that's great. Now, this is where some AI and computer vision comes in. So we'll be taking this work further by using what's, I've got this on order. I'm just emailing to my colleague at QUT. We're trying to sort out how to purchase this. It's something called the Matterport. And it's effectively three Kinect cameras. So if you've got an Xbox and you've got a Kinect camera, you've got a depth camera on it that enables you to use gestures. It understands you in depth. So it's able to understand your movements. Plonk these cameras around in an environment and you model the entire space. It's meant for real estate agents so that you can place people in virtual reality versions of properties for sale and so forth. So one of the things that people often object to me when I used the, you know, started looking at virtual reality and virtual worlds is oh, it takes so much to model this stuff. You don't have to now. So that office that I bought or the airport just use one of these cameras and you can create 3D models very easily. If a real estate agent can do it, I'm sure you guys can as well. So uh, that's one future direction for this. But what I, I guess in, um, in conclusion, uh, you know, this is more just a mind opening exercise trying to sort of, uh, you know, Alberto very kindly asked me over here to talk about what I get up to. But trying to bring this over to AI, I was sitting there thinking last night, how am I going to sort of align this work? Because this is the work I do. I'm not an AI specialist. But of course, because I'm here, I've been primed by what Paul has talked about with data acquisition, getting quality data into these new systems. Here's some possible techniques for doing this. For instance, there's no reason in these environments where you can't have it networked and remotely performed. So somebody can sit in their own home and you can elicit knowledge from them using such environments and feed that into the artificial intelligence systems that you need to extract the knowledge for. The other possibilities as well is that you can process mine from these environments. So those of you who are aware of the Process Mining Initiative by Hulu van der Alst at the Technical University in Eindhoven. Uh, so the whole idea there is put people through these environments mine out the process models. And we're about to write a paper, or well, we've actually written a paper that we're going to submit. We've got some results showing how that's very effective inside a virtual world for various reasons I won't go into here. Um, and last but not least, there's always sort of just using some of the latest immersive technology like the HoloLens. Being able to sit there and look at the top of your table and have these environments projected onto reality for you to engage with when you want to do elicitation exercises or you want to do training exercises. So I guess my final thought as I close is, you know, when you're thinking about how systems interact with humans, consider some of the more modern theories of human intelligence around this embodiment and immersion, because I think these things can be useful in many domains, but in particular, I think they can be used in BPM. And I think it also starts to feed into the interfaces of the artificial intelligence system. This is where you can expose the AI inside an immersive environment, fire up the cognition of a person, getting them an enhanced memory capacity or an enhanced uh, elicitation process and extract the data from them to create your new system. And that's where I will leave it. Thank you very much, Alberto. <laughs>